Good evening. So glad to have you with us tonight. <clears throat> we got a special treat tonight. Pastor Richard Chavez is going to be giving us the message tonight. It's really good. He gave it to me beforehand to uh, look over and put up on the screen. So you're in for a treat. Let me get to the right song here. Here we go. Thank you. All right. Let's stand. Let's sing to our God tonight. Ancient of Days. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, thou and Lord, the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory, every knee shall bow at your throne in worship. Great. 
Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for getting us through this day, for keeping us, Father, tethered to that cross, your cross. May that be our constant position, Father, at the foot of that cross. Eyes stayed locked on you, where you can be our Lord, where you can be our Savior, where you can be our Jehovah Jireh, our provider, our sustainer. That doesn't happen when our eyes are on us or on the things going on around us. Be in that position, Lord. Be there. Take that throne. Make it yours. Again, let there be no other thrones, no other loves that we place before you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for letting us lift our voices to you. We pray that it's been a sweet-smelling aroma to you. Father, now open our ears and the eyes of our hearts and our souls to your word and your spirit. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Right there. I think I have it on. Good evening, church. Good evening. It's good to have you here. What an honor it is when the pastor asked us to fill in for him and say, do you all have your prayer list? Everyone has a prayer list? Okay. Do we have any additions to it? Okay, don't everyone speak at one time. Okay, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to spend a few minutes looking through that gather in groups of four or five, whatever, and then uh, our music pastor said to give us ears to hear with. One of my favorite Bible verses is Luke 8, 18, and I like it better in the NIV where it says, therefore consider carefully how you listen. And most people have missed that verse because they're so used to hearing a sermon or a Sunday school lesson with the verse before it or the verse after it. So I think that the Lord Jesus is telling us that because it really is hard to listen. 
And uh, I know when I did marriage counseling, one of the things mostly the women would always say, well, my husband doesn't listen to me. So I would show them some ways of making sure that they listen to you, and that's by having some feedback. So if you have something that you want to say to your folks, something that you want them to pray for, then someone in that group give them some feedback. I thought I heard you say that you want us to pray for your children. So let's spend a few minutes as we gather together and spend some time praying, lifting up one another, lifting up the folks on our prayer list that we might bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you would. anyone give some feedback in their group? Hmm? Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we just pray that we might have ears to listen, to hear your voice, to hear your spirit, to hear the cries of one another that we might lift them up in prayer. We do adore you, Lord, and pray that you would guide us in every step of our lives, that as we come closer to heaven each day, that you may be pleased as we walk with you and talk with you along life's narrow way. We're grateful, Lord, that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the bright morning star, the lily of the valley, the great I am, our rock, our refuge. We thank you, Lord, and now I ask that you would be with us, guiding us, leading us, and Lord, that you would be for our pastor as he, as he basically uh, shares your love with the people of India. We just pray, Lord, that many might be saved and the church there might grow. Bring them home safely, Lord, and we do thank you for first loving us and teaching us what love really is. And we ask it all in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Amen. Last night I came home from playing golf with Jim, and I had a flare-up, and I, could bear, I couldn't even close my hand or open my hand, so I was up at 1.15 this morning miserably. But I did something that was very interesting after I did my prayer and read some of the Bible. I decided to look at my wife's old Bible, and my wife was very interesting. She left a tremendous legacy, and when she knew it was time for her to go home, she asked me to do something. She said, Dick, I want you to know, over here in the credenza, I have letters for people, and I want you to put a stamp on them and send them, and there's a letter for you, and please don't open it or read it till the Lord takes me home. And so what a blessing that was to the people that knew her. And I never would have thought of that. And I often say, you know, Lord, if I just travel halfway with what my wife did, I think, I think you, would be, you would be happy. She wrote little notes as to what she wanted uh, me to use scripture-wise at her funeral. And uh, also, Dick, I know I don't need to tell you this, but I want it to be very evangelistic. And so it was, and that might have been the hardest sermon I ever preached in my life. 
but I'm naming today a touch of class. And basically there was a man by the name of James Lewis Pettiger. Have you, any of you ever hear of him? Anyway, it was real interesting because his, his life was such that he left such an impression in his community that they wanted to erect a tombstone, and on the tombstone, this is what they wrote. Unawed by opinion, unseduced by flattery, undismayed by disaster, he confronted life with courage and death with Christian hope. Wow. Isn't that great when people in your community see your life in the Lord Jesus Christ? that they can say something about you, and that's the legacy that we need to leave. Not about us, but about Christ in us. In Luke 7, 37 through 38, it says, when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was sitting at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. You see, we, like her, need to admit our sins. And I don't know about you, but every once in a while I need to get back to basics, and that's what this is, that we really need to admit our sins. And I know when I was first saved, I went to a grocery, to a drugstore, and I went in there and asked for something. This kid was there, and anyway, I didn't like the way he talked to me, so my own nature really sprung. And I lashed out at him and said, you know, guy, I can get you fired for the way you talk to me. And then I walked around the corner and the Holy Spirit just hit me. That's not the way Christians behave. So I had to do something that I've never done before in my life. I had to go find that kid and apologize to him and tell him I want you to know that I'm now a Christian. And even though your behavior wasn't right, mine wasn't right. So I'm going to ask you to forgive me. And so that was my first step in a journey to try to please the Lord Jesus Christ. Do I always live the way he wants me to live? No. But I'm glad that he forgives and he restores. So we admit our sins. The woman was a sinner. She was a prostitute. She demonstrated what a sinner has to do in coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. She sensed a desperate need she needed something in her life that was missing. And you can think of when you came to Christ, it might have been something that was missing. For me, it was an emptiness that I couldn't fulfill. I was in home improvement business before I went into ministry, and my high was getting another deal, and, but it never lasted. Or if my wife said she wanted a yellow sports car, the next day it would be in the driveway. And that never lasted. So... The Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing that ever filled my needs. Nothing else did. Money, prestige, power, nothing else did. The only thing that will fill is the Lord Jesus Christ. But she was an interesting woman because when we really learn about her and about her going to him with heavy conviction, his plea for men and women to repent and prepare for the kingdom of God, pierced her heart. And she knew she was a sinner, unclean, lost, condemned. And the guilt and weight of her sin was more than she could hear. She could bear. And so she ached for forgiveness and cleansing, for freedom and liberty. One of the songs that I really love because it so reminds me of me as shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame. For my precious Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. And 
we aren't the same when he touches us. Amen? And how true that really is. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We need to repent. We need to acknowledge our sins and repent, which is what I tried to do in that drugstore. This woman approached the Lord despite all the barriers that were before her. She knew that the public scorned and gossiped about her. And the so-called decent people wanted nothing to do with her. What would Jesus do? He who said, come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. She knew that if she re recognized the Pharisees might throw her out of the house, she knew about her. One of the things that I've learned to do and try to do is sometimes people are just rude and ugly, and so you, you don't know what to do. And so I say, Lord, please let me see through your eyes. And regardless of what that person is doing, I know that Jesus loves them and he died for them. And who am I to stand in the way of their salvation? I need to be an arm and a vessel of his goodness and of his love. And we need to do that so that people will come to Christ. I was literally loved to the Lord Jesus Christ. My wife was saved before I was. And so we went to church, and I bought my first Bible. And I want you to know the only reason I bought the Bible was to go to Sunday school and show people how stupid they were, that these different translations couldn't even agree with one another. But despite all of that, I was literally loved to the Lord. I wasn't condemned, but I was loved. And the pastor of the church was unbelievable, the deacons and all. I know when they first came to visit me and tried to share Christ with me, I thought, well, you know, they're like a spiritual cowboy. They just want another notch on their spiritual gun. But then it came across me because it was a real terrible day with lightning and storms. And I thought, they either believe this or they're crazy. <clears throat> and so I came to the conclusion they really believed it. And I learned something important. Probably the best time to go visiting is when there's a storm. Because people might think the same way. You're either crazy or you really believe this stuff. you got to be nuts to come out in this type of weather. So we need to repent. And she knew, she knew that in her heart. And when the Pharisees who invited, who invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner in Luke seven thirty nine. Wow, have we ever been guilty of that? Looking at someone and saying, you know, they're a drunk or a drug addict, whatever it may be, a flander. And we just kind of sweep them away because we don't want to spend our energy on those kind of people. I'm going to tell you something. Those kind of people need Jesus too. I'll tell you one of the other things that I learned in my life. I was a mission pastor before going to our last church. And it was 95% government subsidized. And the neighborhood that we lived in was one of the nicest neighborhoods in, ba in Baltimore County. And I learned it's easier to share God's love with the down and out than what it is with the up and out. And just because somebody has all of the trappings doesn't mean that they're happy. They all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. We all need to have his love. This woman thought about the situation, and her thinking turned to hope, and her hope turned into belief and surely he who offered such an invitation would receive her before anyone would stop her she rushed to the Lord Jesus Christ and stood behind him at his feet 
And remember in the east, people reclined to eat. And they rested on their left arm, facing each other around the table with their body and feet extending out from the table. In Psalm 34, 18, it says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God loves the brokenhearted. One of my favorite little books, I don't know if you've ever read this, is with Jennifer Kennedy Dean in her book, He Restores My Soul. Any of you ever read that book? Excellent, excellent books. Anyway, here's, here's what she says. She taught us in that book that a broken heart does not mean sadness. Brokenness does not mean sorrow. A person can be sorrowful without being broken. And brokenness does not mean humiliation. A person can be humiliated and not be broken. Brokenness does not mean discouragement. A person can be discouraged and still not be broken. Brokenness is an ongoing process. True brokenness means losing all faith in your own abilities. Abandoning all dependence on human resources and disavowing all outward pretensions of righteousness to cling to the Spirit of God as if a lifeline. A broken person knows that God is the only worthwhile goal. A broken person stands before God as a living offering and declares, you are my one desire. One of the problems that we had in our family for our children is our children came to me years later and said, Dad, you know, I'm really upset because we never were number one. And I said, you were number three, that's pretty good. Number one is the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two was my wife, and number three were my kids. And that's the way it ought to be. The Lord ought to be on his throne in our lives, in our heart. And he ought to always be number one. We need to surrender. She surrendered to the Lord's in utter humility. Standing there, she was overcome with conviction and emotion. She fell at Jesus' feet weeping so broken that tears just flowed from her eyes. She unwound her hair and wiped and kissed Jesus' feet. Seldom had such love and devotion been shown Jesus. There was only one thing that could make a prostitute enter a Pharisee's home, desperation. She was gripped with a sense of lostness, of helplessness, of urgency, and the loosening of her hair to wipe Jesus was forbidden of women in public. She must have been so desperate, she was totally oblivious to the onlookers. The point is this, she was surrendering her heart, surrendering her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. She was begging him to forgive her. When was the last time we begged the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us? She was so broken, she was unable to speak. But Jesus knew her heart. He knows our heart. Words were not necessary. In Luke 7, 47, 49, the word of God says, Therefore I tell you how many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Well, the Lord sure did forgive me. He taught me what love really is. I thought I loved my wife, but I had to repent and realize she was just my trophy wife. I didn't know what love was, so I came to Lord Jesus Christ. And then I really knew what love was for wife, for family, for friends, for neighbors and how important that is to really know what love is. In Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For this is what the high and lofty one says, 
He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is uncontrite and lowly in spirit, to receive the spirit of the lowly and to receive the heart of the contrite. We need to surrender to brokenness. When you choose to place blame on others or feel martyred by circumstances beyond your control, you resuscitate your self-life. When on the other hand, when on the other hand, you choose to look away from the outside cause and accept the crucifying work of the Holy Spirit you begin little by little to let the old nature die and the new nature emerge. You have chosen to lay down your self-life, your pride, your expectations, your rights, and your demands. We need to choose the way of the cross. I was invited once to go to lunch with one of my workers, and I did everything in my power not to go because I figured either the army was after him, which I had someone do that, they were a deserter. He's got someone pregnant, who it was and all. And we were doing the right, the, the house of the evangelism director for Baptist Convention, Maryland, Delaware. And so he said, you know, Pastor, I, I really need to talk to you, Dick. So I couldn't escape that, so we went to this restaurant. And in that restaurant, he said, Dick, I know everything hadn't been perfect in your life, but you have something that I want. And that was the first person I ever led to the Lord. And when you lead the first one, you're going to keep on leading uh, and, and sharing. And it, it, was, it was very interesting because there in that restaurant filled, jam-packed, we prayed, and he trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior and Lord. So we need to learn, you know, and, and, and I need to learn, well, you need to be careful if somebody wants to talk to you, talk to them. How important that is. You never know what someone's thinking. They look at your life and they may want what you have. They may want what we have as a church, that we can love the Lord and we can love one another. Wow, that's not very popular today, is it? But we can do it. And... See, one of the things I used to tell my congregation, we need to learn to provoke people to jealousy. That they'll be jealous of our lives. They'll be jealous because we love one another so much and we love the Lord. We need to learn to give. She loved much, gave her most precious possession. Perfume was highly valued by all the women of that day. Apparently, by describing the perfume as she does, Luke is trusting the expense of the perfume and the great sacrifice she was making. It was probably the most costly possession that she had. So she was giving it to the Lord. I like what the pastor said a few weeks ago, and that's what I want to do in our church. I wanted to get a rug made that looked like a big offering plate, and people would offer their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and how important that is. And, 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 and we, we need to understand that, that we're no longer the same. We're his, and we belong to him. The only way to open the alabaster jar was to break it. However, there's something more important here. Note what she did with the perfume. She anointed the Lord, anointed his feet in a supreme act of humility, love, and surrender. In Isaiah 66, 12, it says, has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. This is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Wow, his word is powerful. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. 
And we need to go to his word and see the power of his word. The person who comes to Christ must come with a broken and contrite heart. The person who comes to Christ must have his packaging broken so that the life of Christ may be dispersed. When we're broken, then we disperse the Lord Jesus Christ. And others see that it's no longer us, but it's the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to lift him higher and higher. The alabaster jar, like you and me, exists for one reason, to be acceptable for something else. And the alabaster jar held the perfume, and you and I can contain and pour out the Son of God, the Spirit of God. We also need to learn how to receive. And that's hard. That was hard for me. I don't know about you. It was easier to give than to receive. But we really take a blessing away from the Lord and from one another when someone wants to give us something or do something for us. And we say, oh, no, I don't need it. I got plenty of that. We can't rob someone of their blessing. That's not right. Hebrews 4, 15, 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When the outside package, the alabaster jar, is cherished and safeguarded, the inside is kept hidden. Until we choose brokenness, we cannot receive the power of forgiveness. We cannot live in the power of the resurrection. Our brokenness releases his fullness. There was a little girl that was late coming home from school. And her mother, like mothers and fathers, began to worry. And when the little girl got home, her mother asked her what happened. And she said, I stopped to help a little girl. She was crying because her doll had broken. And the mother said, that was kind of you. Did you help her fix the doll? And the little girl replied, she said, no, I stopped to help her cry. Don't we need to do that? Stop and help one another cry? How important that is. I hope getting back to the basics might have been a blessing to you. It was a blessing to me as I prepared all of this. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, that we might have a contrite spirit, a broken heart. We pray, Lord, that others may see Jesus in us, that we may get out of the way, and they may not see us, that we might not succumb to flattery, that we may live our lives in a way that others may come to the Lord Jesus and know that we were a man or a woman of integrity of love for you and love for one another. So now, Lord, bless us, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. John said I had 45 minutes, and let me say to you what I always did with first sermons. Some sermons are 15 minutes and some are 45 minutes, and I don't prolong it just so I can get to the 45 minutes. So you can spend some time praying, or you can get out of here however it is that you want to do it. Thank you for being here. I love you guys, and uh, pray that you'll be a blessing this day. Thank you.